I'm confident that we will not need more than four weeks and we won't need to go beyond July the 19th. I think crypto is the next internet-sized opportunity for the United States. Russia that is not acting in a way that is consistent with what we had hoped. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Tuesday, the 15th of June. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. War and peace. NATO warns about China's rising military ambitions as the U.S. and the EU end their 17-year dispute over aircraft subsidies ahead of today's summit in Brussels. End of the COVID boom, Jamie Dimon signals a trading revenue drop of more than a third after last year's record numbers. Meanwhile, Goldman Sachs leads the return to office race on Wall Street. And the UK ends the COVID restrictions for four weeks in England. This as both AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccines are shown to be more than 90% effective at preventing hospitalizations from the Delta variant. So good morning, everyone. China's rising military ambitions present NATO with challenges that must be addressed. That's according to the alliance, marking a shift in its stance that could kindle confrontation with Beijing. The Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg heralded the speed at which the group stepped up the meeting of the threats. We are concerned by China's coercive policies, which stand in contrast to the fundamental values enshrined in the Washington Treaty. China is rapidly expanding its nuclear arsenal with more warheads and a larger number of sophisticated, sophisticated delivery systems. Well, China has responded to NATO's communique through a statement by its mission to the European Union. Beijing says it doesn't pose systemic challenges to any nation, but it would not sit back if any country poses such challenges to China. Well, joining us now with more is Bloomberg's international government executive editor, Ross Matheson. Ross, thank you so much for always making the time to, to come on because I know you have a very busy day. But has the alliance now been reinvigorated? Well, you can see the shift in NATO, at least from the Donald Trump presidency, when, of course, Trump frequently questioned NATO and particularly uh, the commitments other countries were making to. And, of course, the French president famously called NATO nearly brain dead only several years ago. So the tone at the summit this week has been markedly different, one of presenting a united front as, as much as possible, talking about common threats, not just China, of course, but also the big one in Europe's own backyard, which is, which is Russia, and talking about working uh, more collaboratively to confront those challenges. And, of course, also trying to paper over some tensions that NATO has had in recent years with one of its key members, which is Turkey. So you can see at least on the surface of it an effort to say we're working on these issues together. Of course, the reality is that the way that they may see themselves needing to manage those relationships is quite different still. Ros, ahead of the U.S.-EU summit, we're also reporting that two, the two sides are set to end the 17-year Boeing Airbus dispute. What do we actually know about it? Well, that's right. This was something that's been flagged for a couple of weeks now. We could see movement towards a resolution and a real desire to put this thing to bed. Of course, it was affecting about $12 billion worth of tariffs and really hitting both countries, arguably, and both companies, arguably, quite hard. And again, a recognition that, uh, that doing so would arguably weaken both Airbus and Boeing at a time when you've got Chinese aerospace companies really pushing outwards um, and expanding their influence into other the parts of the world. And is this the time to be having your own sort of big marquee state, state companies um, in trouble? So there was a recognition there that they really needed to put this dispute aside. Um, and it's part of that, again, that sense of you want to cooperate with China on certain things, but you really need to compete with them economically. Uh, so it looks like they've decided uh, to reach a resolution on that one. It should be announced later today. So what else do we know, you know, on, on the Biden agenda, basically visiting Europe, he has a pretty packed agenda. Tomorrow he's also meeting in Geneva, Vladimir Putin. What do you think, Roz, will be his toughest day? Well, the biggest thing, of course, in all of this probably has to be his sit down tomorrow in Geneva uh, with the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. There's a lot riding on that for him, uh, less so for the Russian leader, because really he gets the win just by having uh, Biden show up and shake his hand uh, and the recognition that he's looking for. For Biden, there's opportunity uh, in meeting the Russian president, but also a fair amount of risk. He has to come away potentially with some sort of tangible to show for it and also the sense that he is standing up to Vladimir Putin. Um, 
over various issues that the U.S. is concerned about, including ransomware attacks. Um, so there's quite a lot of pressure on him to show something from this, more than we've just agreed to sort of diffuse tensions in the short term, perhaps some gestures on either side. Um, but he has to balance the way that he's perceived at the end of that meeting. Uh, so that's probably the biggest thing on his plate for this whole swing through summits in Europe. Roz, thank you so much. Bloomberg's executive editor there for international government, Roz Matheson. Now, England's Freedom Day has been delayed. As expected, Boris Johnson yesterday announced he was pushing back, lifting virus curbs by a month. That's amid concern over a rapid rise in COVID cases as the highly contagious Delta variant spreads. Meanwhile, data out this morning also shows that UK payrolls surged the most on record in May. Now, companies stepped up hiring as coronavirus lockdown rules were being eased. While Bloomberg's UK economy reporter, Lizzie Burden, now joins us. Lizzie, good morning to you. So what did the UK jobs data show actually this morning? Well, the UK added jobs for a sixth month and vacancies climbed 16%. In May, remember, this is the month when restaurants and cinemas reopened. So that's explaining the surge in demand for jobs in May. It could be a different story in June, though, because of this delay to the reopening. Lizzie, this extension is as devastating for certain sectors, but what does it mean for the economy in, in general? As you say, it'll be a blow to certain sectors, mainly because of the continuation of social distancing rules, uh, which will severely curtail earnings, especially in hospitality. This is meant to be the peak season for that industry. But despite the postponement of easing, um, the government isn't planning to extend support for businesses. The furlough scheme, for example, still uh, will be tapered as planned. And that's despite the warnings of hospitality bosses that hundreds of thousands of jobs could be lost in that sector um, and so uh, it's uh, the government could be allowing this because of the labor shortages in various sectors it could be allowing people to move around the economy but also it's going to save on the ballooning cost of furlough it'll be really bad for hospitality arts entertainment travel but away from those sectors economists have been expecting a two to four week delay um, the mobility and confidence in the economy is recovering despite the restrictions so overall it might not actually be that big of an economic hit Thank you so much, our UK economy reporter there, Lizzie Burden. Now, we're also just getting some breaking news in terms of a tree deal, a free trade, if I could get my words out. Happy Tuesday, everyone. The UK is saying that there's a free trade deal agreed with Australia that, for example, this deal will boost car, uh, whiskey and confectionery industries. And it basically, it also eliminates some of the tariffs that we've seen on Australian wine being imported into U the UK. So we'll watch for that. And, of course, it will benefit specific industries as well. Coming up, inflation has been on everybody's lips as economic stimulus wrestles with tight supply lines. Opinions remain divergent and millions of missing jobs can also make inflation hawks think twice. So we'll have the details on that next. This is Bloomberg. finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the future of inflation is being hotly debated as economies continue down the path of reopening. As the argument rages on, the Fed begins its two-day meeting with the subject on everyone's minds. Well, joining us now is Geraldine Sundstrom, Portfolio Manager at PIMCO, focusing on asset allocation strategies. Geraldine, as always, thank you so much uh, for coming on. When you look at inflation, and this is really anyone really talks about in the markets, it's unclear if we do see stronger inflation and if the Fed is wrong, when we would see it. So first of all, Geraldine, do you believe, like the market now seems to, that actually any spike in inflation is temporary? Well, anyway, for, for base effect reason, there would even there would be a time when inflation uh, will go lower. Uh, the uncertainty around forecast at the moment is particularly elevated. We are going through something that's really unprecedented. It's likely that inflation will remain elevated for, for a few more months. But after that, we definitely see things, you know, coming down. All the more than looking into 2022, um, the fiscal stimulus, the monetary stimulus uh, is going to, to be withdrawn around the world. So um, economies should slow down pretty much, even though we still see them 
growing above trend. So ultimately, inflation should get back into a reasonable level after um, a couple of, of, of quarter, most likely. So when you look at you know, the possible overheating economy, do you worry about the U.S., uh, Geraldine, but is it a worry that we should think about in Europe or is Europe just completely different? Excess saving um, capex plans are pretty strong, um, I would say, in a, in a quite generalized manner. Of course, in the U.S., maybe the, the fiscal stimulus has been stronger. Um, excess saving are particularly strong as well. So um, if there were to be a place, the U.S. would certainly be ahead of Europe um, in, in terms of, of risk. Yes. Um, Geraldine, overall, what's your biggest concern when it comes to asset allocation? So is there something apart from inflation that we could be misreading? Of course, like markets have, have moved, have really embraced uh, the recovery. We know that taper uh, is going to come at some point. It's well telegraphed. Um, it would seem that the situation in many ways is very different uh, from 2013. But there will, of course, uh, always be a bit of nerves um, around. We don't think it will derail anything from a fundamental standpoint. It's much more, you know, markets with a volatile tendency uh, because, you know, the injection of liquidity will start to slow down. But we think it's going to be well telegraphed. It's going to be very gradual. And um, with growth being good, with pent-up demand uh, being good, risk assets should do fine. Is there a value in emerging markets? Or how do you split it, Geraldine? Where do you choose to put your money right now? So in terms of equities, we're looking at it much more from a sectoral standpoint and making a difference between what is sustainable and what is a one-off. And certainly there are some sectors uh, which are going to be secularly supported that have pricing power, that have barriers to entry, where we still find good value um, in terms of um, you know, semiconductors, forest, uh, AI, automation. Um, there, there's a number of sectors, even maritime transport for that matter. So um, we're, we're looking at this in, in this way. There are other areas which, of course, are much more one-off that are going to be more ephemeral and where we choose not to be so so present. In terms of fixed income, um, I'd say in, in, in credit, we like still the reopening trade. There's still you know, some room to go, but we are tending to be much more into the securitized part of the market because credit spreads, generic credit spreads are, are, are becoming quite rich. Uh, Geraldine, in terms of equities, do, I mean, do te does technology at the moment look uh, expensive or are there parts of the market where you could see, still see prices rising? Um, I would differentiate the hardware from the software. So when we look at hardware, I would say this is our favorite part of the market in terms of, you know, semiconductor equipment, uh, machine vision, um, automation, and some, this, this part of the tech we feel is, is highly attractive. The software internet part, we're a bit more cautious because, you know, it doesn't really go necessarily well with the reopening trade, but also regulation um, is becoming harsher uh, from China to the United States via Europe. So uh, we distinguish between the hardware and the software, and in the hardware, we certainly see um, quite attractive valuation, in fact, as all the more then the pricing power pendulum seems to have moved from uh, the software to the hardware manufacturers, given scarcity. Um, Geraldine, on the back of what we heard at NATO and the fact that actually, you know, they were talking about the Chinese military, that China responded through their envoy saying that they are watching this very closely. Are the supply chains, because of the Trump era, now moved and so, you know, can't move more or it, could that be a disruption that could also hit some of the industries that you're looking at? So there, there will be disruption for sure in strategic areas, I would say, mostly in the technology as well as probably in the pharmaceutical industry, which we think a bit about less. However, you have to look at this probably as an opportunity in the sense that for this strategic sector, be it in China or the United States or Europe, they are trying to create very welcoming uh, and very supportive uh, environment in terms of subsidies, in terms of taxation regime, 
Um, and this means more investment uh, than anything else equal. And that's why we like the semiconductor equipment makers, because we will, you know, countries and, and region want to reshore production away from Asia or even Taiwan, for that matter, because of tensions with China, back into the United States, back into Europe. So everything else equal, this means more investment and a more, uh, more uh, you know, friendly environment uh, from, from the part of government. So this should be seen as an opportunity um, in that case. Geraldine, thank you so much. Geraldine Sundstrom, their PIMCO portfolio manager. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Here in England, the coronavirus lockdown will last at least another four weeks. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has pushed back his plan to lift restrictions until at least July the 19th. A more infectious variant has spread rapidly across the country. It threatens to undermine efforts to vaccinate the country's way out of the pandemic. Once again, there is concern that there could be blackouts in the two most populous U.S. states. Heat waves in Texas and California are threatening to push electrical grids to the brink. Texans are being asked to conserve power because a number of generating plants are currently offline for repairs. California's grid has been swamped with demand due to temperatures expected to hit over 110 degrees Fahrenheit in the next few days. And China is warning NATO it will not sit back in the face of any challenges. Beijing also said that the alliance should not exaggerate Chinese military power. This statement illustrates the potential for tensions to escalate. The U.S. is trying to convince its allies to take a tougher approach to China. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg Francie. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, coming up, stocks in the green again after the Nasdaq closed last night at an all-time high. More on the markets next with our Danny Berger. This is Bloomberg. I do think we're going to have higher inflation, and but I don't think it's going to run away the way some people do. And, and to that end, I don't. I think yeah. bond yields will move higher, but not to mm. not to unattractive levels. Well, that's KKR's head of global macro and asset allocation, Henry Vey, on inflation risks. Now let's get straight to the markets with our very own Danny Berger. Hi, Danny. Tomorrow's FOMC meeting, the big event of the week, but we also have retail sales and PPI out today. What does the setup actually look like for the markets? I have to say, Francine, I feel like the market's sort of sending the same message as KKR there. That is that it's looking through uh, what's expected to be a spike in inflation in today's PPI numbers. Uh, you can see really those concerns aren't there when you look at what equities are doing. We have this stark outperformance of growth stocks. So you have the Nasdaq 100 yesterday hitting all-time highs while Russell 2000 shares fell. You can still see that outperformance in today's future prices as well. Uh, yields perhaps more so pressed pricing in more moderate growth relatively. So a bit of a disconnect there. Uh, but really, I think that retail sales figure is going to be interesting because while market participants might be saying we're not worried about inflation, a question that arises is whether the consumer is. And this is something that uh, Sebastian Daly from Nordea flags as a potential risk. If retail sales come in really weak, if volumes are low but prices are high, it shows that the consumer uh, has issues with those high prices. And, and that, in turn, might cause the Fed, might cause uh, the Treasury Department to reassess their view on the economy. So, again, I, I, I do think that that retail sales figure will be really interesting today, despite the fact uh, most people are really looking forward to tomorrow's FOMC, Francine. Yeah, Danny, there were a couple of things in the Chinese market. I mean, I think they're, they're, they had concern about liquidity. So I don't know if you think, you know, that's something that we need to watch out for here mm. uh, in, in Europe as well. And then metals were down. 
Yeah, that's right. And I and I also think that so metals partially about that China story and concerns about liquidity and demand, but also about that inflation fear receding. So we're not seeing metals priced as high as they were. Danny, thanks so much. Our Danny Berger there with the full roundup, of course, of what we're watching today in the markets. And then uh, Danny's back also for a full roundup of what we could see amongst bank earnings. Now let's take a look at some of the other things that we're watching out for today. At 10 a.m. UK time, we'll have euro area trade balance figures. At 1.15 p.m., the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey due to speak at the City UK annual conference. And then this afternoon, we'll have data from the U.S., including PPI and retail sales. Of course, keep an eye on the EU U.S. summit with Brus in Brussels with President Joe Biden attending. Plus, the U.K. Prime Minister Boris Johnson will also hold a bilateral meeting with his Australian counterpart, Scott Morrison. I think we had breaking news in the last couple of minutes that actually they came to a trade agreement. And then Oracle Corporation is expected to report earnings for the first fiscal quarter. Coming up, resolution. After a 17-year dispute, the U.S. and the EU agreed to end their dispute over aircraft subsidies. We'll bring you the details next. This is Bloomberg. Peace NATO warns about China's rising military ambitions as the U.S. and EU and their 17-year dispute over aircraft subsidies ahead of today's summit in Brussels. End of the COVID boom, Jamie Dimon signals a trading revenue drop of more than a third after last year's record numbers. Meanwhile, Goldman Sachs leads the return to the office race on Wall Street. And the U.K. extends COVID restrictions for four weeks in England. This, as both AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccines, are shown to be more than 90% effective at preventing hospitalizations from the Delta variant. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Francine Lacquin, London. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Tuesday, the 15th of June. Now, China's rising military ambitions present NATO with challenges that must be addressed. That's according to the alliance, marking a shift in its stance that could kindle a confrontation with Beijing. Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg heralded the speed at which the group stepped up to meet up threats. We are concerned by China's coercive policies, which stand in contrast to the fundamental values enshrined in the Washington Treaty. China is rapidly expanding its nuclear arsenal with more warheads and a larger number of sophisticated, sophisticated delivery systems. Well, China has responded to NATO's communique through a statement by its mission to the European Union. Beijing says it doesn't pose systematic or systemic challenges to any nations, but it would not sit back if any country poses such challenges to China. Well, joining us now from our Brussels bureau is our correspondent Maria Tadeo. Maria, great to have you on the program. What actually came out of NATO uh, yesterday? Well, Francine, you know, first of all, there was a very clear pledge that NATO is still a very relevant institution, that this is an alliance that sees a future. And when you speak to the American delegation, that is something that they wanted to really present and cement this idea that the U.S. will always honor what they now call their sacred duty to protect NATO and Article 5. When you look at the Europeans, it was still very much uh, the same line, you know, to say we want to work together and we want to protect our allies. Of course, we know that on paper, there's still differences when you look at what the Germans believe, when you look at the French, when you look at President Erdogan, also of Turkey, yesterday. But overall, it was very much a session designed to send a message to both China and Russia, seeing NATO still very united on China. As you said right there, they were very explicit. The Chinese, they're an economic power, but they could also turn into a military power that could be a threat to the global order. And when you look at the communique, Russia was mentioned many times as now as a country that is aggressive to its eastern neighbors that could pose a threat to countries like Ukraine, Moldova, but also Poland and Lithuania. We will not be divided. And, and, and that, I think, happened too many times over the last months, was that the United States and Europe were basically uh, split apart. Right. That, I think, is not going to happen uh, that easily anymore. 
And that's uh, what's Francine, the Belgium uh, prime minister. As I said, you know, the Europeans repeat in this line that we're staying together and we're not going to be divided, especially when you look at the Eastern European neighbors who do feel that the situation when it comes to Russia has really escalated over the past year, especially as troops have been moving into the east. Maria, thank you so much. Our Maria today there from Brussels with the very latest, of course, on what's been happening in NATO. Now, joining us to discuss this more in depth is Anthony Gardner. He's former U.S. ambassador to the EO, EU. Um, Ambassador, thank you so much. I know you speak like a million languages, which always really impresses me. I think that's what you have to do when you're an international man of mystery. When you see the president <laughs> Biden's agenda and what exactly he's here to do in Europe, what will be his most difficult day? He went from the G7 to NATO to this EU, EU summit, US, EU summit, and then to meeting Vladimir Putin tomorrow. Well, the most difficult day will be meeting Vladimir Putin, clearly. Um, but these trips are very important because they are of symbolic uh, significance, given what happened in the last four years during Donald Trump, particularly with regard to the EU, because the prior administration thought the EU was. Uh, essentially a waste and not effective. This administration considers, in my view, appropriately, the EU is actually a critical partner. So that summit is going to be uh, very important. Uh, I welcome the fact there's going to be a Boeing Airbus agreement. I haven't seen the text yet. There are going to be some interesting discussions in there about what kind of subsidies are going to be covered going forward. Um, and there's going to be some difficult conversations as well about what about those aluminum and steel tariffs and that's a difficult domestic political issue for the president, but I think there is a way forward on that topic as well. But clearly, the discussion with Putin is going to be very direct. I suspect there's a lot of unfinished business, Francine, in the last administration. So uh, I believe that Biden will say, look, this time, unlike the last four years, I stand shoulder to shoulder with an alliance, and we will respond seriously. Ambassador, when you look at some of the, you, you know, what the U.S. actually needs the EU for, is it to deal with China and Russia, or is it just to try and go back to a new, a more new, nor, you know, an older normal uh, world order? For, it, you know, we'll rely or hope to work with the EU on many areas, but China clearly is the acid test. Now, some in the EU and member states don't want to hear that message. Um, they keep on saying... Yes, of course, we, we, we're going to work with you on China, but we see China a different way. The fact of the matter is, politically, it is the acid test. That's the way Congress looks at it. Many U.S. voters will look at it. What good are allies, including the EU, if they're not going to work with us on the key challenge going forward? Um, the EU likes to say we want to work within the rules. Of course, we want to work within the rules, too, in institutions like the WTO. But rules are just not going to be enough, Francine. It's going to have to also mean sending China some very clear messages. We saw that coming out of NATO. I hope we see it coming out of the EU as well. The U.S. and the Trade uh, and Tech Council will be very much part of that. The supply chains will be part of that discussion as well, reducing our reliance on China. And also, how do we get significant WTO reform? Does China retaliate? So what's the best way to actually deal with China? Well, one of the best ways is actually finally working with our allies, and this is what this is all about. You know, in the old days, uh, under Trump, it was bilateral, transactional, one-on-one uh, -on -one with, with China, because the EU thought that the EU was um, a distraction. But if we work with our allies, particularly the EU, and let's remember, the EU is a trading and regulatory superpower in those two areas, it's much more effective to go to China and say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to bring more cases against you, but we're not just. We're actually going to close our markets to you if you don't open up your markets and open up your investment practices. Um, so it's a much more effective way of proceeding, and I think the Chinese understand that very well. Remember, they've been looking for years at ways of dividing uh, Europe uh, internally and dividing Europe from the United States. Ambassador, what does Russia actually need from the U.S. tomorrow? What do they need? Well, I think they're getting what they want, which is a recognition that Russia is a player, that the United States takes Russia seriously, and hence this, this uh, meeting, the summit. Uh, and clearly, they're a player in some parts of the world, and we can cooperate th with them on, on some areas of uh, you know, important issues like climate change and so forth, uh, and also the Iran agreement. Um, so they're getting what they want, uh, but I think the message will be, um, you know, no more election interference. You have to control these bodies that are operating in Russia, sometimes with state approval and sometimes, you know, the state is looking the other way. 
bodies that are, um, you know, putting out a lot of disinformation that's repeated in our media. So there's going to be some strong discussion about that. But does Vladimir Putin, I mean, what's the incentive for, for Vladimir Putin to kind of, you know, heed the warnings and maybe temper what's been happening over the last four to five years? Well, to date, we've done rather modest things in response to uh, Russia's aggressive behaviors. I mean, expelling a few diplomats, of course, means nothing. But if we can work with our allies <clears throat> in tightening the sanctions we have in place on Russia, and doing things which are asymmetric, you know, uh, releasing information to the social media about exactly what uh, the Kremlin is doing with its cronies, it's the kleptocratic nature of the regime, uh, embarrass Putin if necessary, or engage in cyber activities to send a message that we too can play this game, um, that will send a very strong message. So no more business as usual of these modest half measures. And we should even consider sectoral sanctions if the EU is re ready to go along. That's always a big problem. Under my time as ambassador to the EU, it was, it was very difficult, even after the invasion of Ukraine, to get all of the EU member states to act. But we finally did. Remember, we finally did, late but quite effectively. Anthony Gardner, thank you so much for joining us today, former U.S. ambassador there to the EU. Now, coming up, there's good news on the vaccine front. Those who have had two doses of either Pfizer or AstraZeneca shots appear to be well protected against the Delta variant. We'll look at what's happening exactly in the UK. We'll look at variants and vaccinations next. This is Bloomberg. finance, politics, and of course the virus. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now this hour we've had confirmation, first of all, that the UK-Australia free trade deal is happening. This is the first major bilateral trade deal that the UK has brokered since it left the European Union in January 2020. Downing Street says the deal with Australia will boost its bid for the CPTPP really rolls off the tongue as it seeks to strengthen trans-Pacific relations post-Brexit. Now, we'll have plenty more, of course, on that. We'll look at currency moves, but let's get straight to the Bloomberg business flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Emirates has slumped to a record $6 billion loss in the financial year to March as the pandemic disrupted travel. The state-owned airline received a capital injection of $3.1 billion from its owner, the government of Dubai. As a result, Emirates has been hit especially hard with the border closures related to the coronavirus pandemic. Now, Dan Loeb's hedge fund, Third Point, is said to have built a substantial position in Vivendi and is examining the French company's plan to sell a 10% stake in Universal Music to Bill Ackman's blank check company. Several of Vivendi's minority shareholders have really voiced opposition to this deal, but sources say Third Point has not given its opinion on the transaction just yet. Vivendi's spin-off of Universal Music goes to a shareholder vote on the 22nd of June. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Thank you so much, Leanne. Now, AstraZeneca's antibody cocktail has failed to prevent COVID-19 in a recent study. It was found to be only 33% effective at preventing COVID-19 symptoms in people who had been exposed to the virus. Now, the trial, named Storm Chaser, is one of the six advanced stage studies AstraZeneca is running to test the medicine. Meanwhile, there was some good news on the vaccine front. Now, according to health authorities in England, shots from Pfizer and AstraZeneca are highly effective at preventing hospitalization of those infected with the Delta variant after two shots. Now, the Pfizer shot is 96% effective against hospitalization after two doses, while the AstraZeneca shot is 92% effective. The results are comparable with the protection offered against the Alpha variant, which first emerged in the UK. Joining us now is Sam Fazelli, Senior Pharmaceuticals Analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Sam, great to have you on the program because I have a million and one questions about exactly what we're living through. So first of all, it seems that the UK it's been kind of stonewalled by the EU because we have genome sequencing, because the cases are rising. So first of all, is the situation much worse in the UK than it is in Europe? 
or is it that just we measure things differently? No, it definitely is worse than, than it is in Europe in terms of the resurgence of the cases, because we were doing fantastically well. This Delta variant is really the second highest country after India in terms of uh, the percentage of cases. So it is worse, and we know much more about it because we do a lot more sequencing. Right. But do the other so do, do other countries also measure if they have the Delta or the Alpha variant? They do, they do, but not at the same level. Okay, so here, I mean, what, 90% of all cases oh, yeah, yeah. are Delta no, we're, variant? We'll, we'll probably be 100 pretty soon. And it's not, it, so it's not more deadly, it just spreads more quickly. It, more deadly is tough to say, but we do know that it's got about twice the risk of hospitalization than the Alpha variant. That's been now shown two or three times. And so, what, I mean, why is that? So it's not only that it's, you catch it easier. You catch it easier. And it's also possible that somehow the biology of the virus or the way that it interacts with your body gets the virus in, in, in more places, gets you sicker, sets off your, evades your immune system better when it first gets in. So you get a much bigger infection. You need to go to hospital. Um, so Sam, when, I mean, yesterday we heard from, you know, officials here in the UK that were looking at modeling. And the, I, the numbers really shocked me. They basically say that if we continue as it is, and if we open on 21st of June, you'd have as many hospitalizations than we had back in 2020, like in April 2020, which was huge. It was over 3,000 a day. So what, I mean, is the only way, you know, not opening further, but also even going back in lockdown? Look, people will hate me for saying this, but I wish we'd stopped eating and drinking indoors in terms of restaurants and pubs. But you have to multiply a few things together. Twice as 50% more transmissible, twice as hosp increased hospitalizations. So maybe you can multiply those two, although they're related. Um, and it evades your previous immunity, and it evades vaccines more than the alpha variant in terms of infections. So there's no question, therefore, that you just get a rampant rise, and exponential things are really awful to deal with. But so what's the right strategy? So, I mean, apart from going back into some sort of lockdown, mm -hmm. if, if I'm vaccinated two times, you know, will I avoid the hospital? Uh, but the data saying you will, to, to the percentage, to the fact that there are still a few percentage of people who will be hospitalized, but that's what the data says. But Francine, our life is not driven by hospitalizations today, which is why I think that phrase started coming out. We have to learn to live with this. If you notice that phrase, well, probably the first time that I really heard it, I heard it anyway. That's the problem. We're counting cases. We run our lives by cases. We open and close by cases. We travel. You can't travel if you test positive. It's not saying if you're really sick. That's the problem we're dealing with now. But, but what I still don't understand, so the, the, you have vaccine passports in Europe where if I'm double vaccinated in France, I can go to Italy, Germany, and Portugal, no problem. But it's not the same with the UK. Will that ever change? Is it politics or, is, or actually does, do the numbers make sense when you look at... Yeah, I don't think it's politics. If you're a country that's be half the way that the UK is in terms of numbers of double vaccinations and you have the risk of having the, the Delta variant, why would you want that to start flying about? when you've got a, uh, to give yourself time to get to that two doses. Okay, so why is the Delta variant stronger here in the UK? And actually, does the 12 week, which was a strategy of the UK, you give the first dose so that you touch as many people as, as you, you can and then wait 12 weeks, was that wrong? Well, you know, with hindsight, yes. But at the time, I was, a, I was worried about exactly this. Then the data came through, it was looking fantastic. We cut hospitalizations and death, and now we have a variant. This is what we were worried about. Either the one dose on its own causes the variant to evolve, or something comes along that evades it, which is what we ended up with. All right, Sam, thank you so much. As always, Sam Fazeli there, our senior pharmaceuticals analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, for more on the Delta variant, make also sure you catch our Q&A with Sam later today. I'll be following and also probably asking you know, the last 990 questions I didn't get to. That's at 3 p.m. London time today on T Live on the Bloomberg Terminal. So if you have a Bloomberg Terminal, you just type T Live and you can follow Sam's great Q&A. Coming up, back to the office. Goldman Sachs leads the pack when it comes to getting staff back behind their desks. But is it really a competition? We'll have plenty more on that. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London.
Now, while European bankers are seeing a slow return to the office, U.S. banks are putting pressure on staff to get back to their desk. This week, Goldman Sachs is beginning its return to the office in earnest. The bank has also set a deadline last week for employees to report their vaccination results. Well, Bloomberg, or vaccination status, I should say. Bloomberg's Shanali Bazak reports from Goldman's New York City headquarters. Goldman Sachs is bringing thousands of its employees back to its offices across the United States, with some exception. However, for most employees, it will be back to a five-day office work week. Thousands of interns will start for the first time in offices as well, while vaccinated employees across the country will no longer need to wear a mask. Those without vaccinations will still need to be wearing a mask at all times except for their desks. European offices will be close behind Goldman Sachs expects to open offices in Europe as early as next week. Shanali Basic, Bloomberg News in New York. Now let's get more with our Danny Berger. Danny, how do other banks actually compare to Goldman's when it comes to the return to work? Well, there's definitely a divide when you look at UK European banks versus Goldman. Shanali there had mentioned that Goldman's going to start looking at opening some of their European offices. Uh, JP Morgan Goldman certainly looking at, at phasing in a return when it comes to Canary Wharf. But if you go to these places, they're largely empty at the moment, Francine. Uh, you have Barclays, for example, still talking about a phased return. No one's going to be mandated to come back in. HSBC is still looking at more of a hybrid model, giving up some of their office space. So yes, it really comes down to these cultural differences between the big U.S. lenders uh, and those in Europe. So we're unlikely to see any sort of even policy. Uh, you know, we're unlikely to in here in Europe to see something like Goldman Sachs, where I'm kind of jealous of Shanali yesterday, even though she was out there in the rain. I mean, it was like a festival. They had free food. Uh, they had live music. Uh, Francine, I'm still uh, have yet to hear, though, whether or not Goldman Sachs played the latest hit from David Solomon, a.k.a. Uh, DJ Soul, who just released a single right before the offices reopened. I know, I love that. First, I mean, the two things that shot, first of all, I love that song. I know our producer, George, does, and I know, Danny, you like it as well, so we have the same music <laughs> taste. Uh, and, and then people are coming in at 8.30, which for a news, you know, for a news organization, I was like, that's quite late. <laughs> mm, yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> Uh, um, Danny, J.P. Morgan's Jamie Dimon is also warning of a steep decline to revenue after the pandemic boom. Have a listen. Last quarter is exceptional. This quarter is what I call more normal, where you can plug in your model and make it really simple. It's like something a little bit north of six billion, which is still pretty good, by the way, and probably better than we told you last time. But last time we said more like 2019. I forget what that number was, but uh, plug in a number a little bit north of six. So does this warning, Danny, actually come as a surprise to Wall Street watchers? Well, we did see shares decline about 2% for J.P. Morgan. Other banking shares fell as well. So, uh, you know, it, it did cause a readjustment in markets. Perhaps not a full-out surprise, considering that banking executives had been warning about this really since uh, the, the peak of, of earnings when it comes to trading revenue because of this pandemic boom. Uh, and Jamie Dimon himself went on to say that, look, it's, it's not necessarily that the figures are going to be bad, but it's more of a return to normal. But still, we're in a situation situation where investors and traders are like are, are having to adjust. This is the first time they're really getting concrete numbers from JP Morgan of what the revenue is going to look like. So they're putting those into their models uh, and that in turn is causing a fall in these share prices because what he said was worse than what was expected, Francine. Danny, thanks so much. Our Danny Berger there with the very latest on uh, the banks. And now Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller joins me out of Berlin, Katie Lyons out of New York. This is Bloomberg. China's growing influence and uh, international policies presents challenges to alliance security. When it comes to China, you've got to... I don't think anybody around the table today wants to descend into a new Cold War with China. We are open for dialogue with, uh, with China. We are open for business with, uh, with China, but on elements of reciprocity. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix, Matt Miller, and Keely Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 11 a.m. in Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong, and our top stories today. 
Tough talk from China. Beijing warns it won't sit back if it's challenged by NATO. A truce, a truce on tariffs. The EU and the U.S. have agreed to settle the long-running trade dispute over Boeing and Airbus that has led to billions in duties on imports. And keep your distance. Boris Johnson's plan to lift social distancing rules in the U.K. have been delayed for a month because of that more infectious variant of the coronavirus. Now, of course, there's lots going on. We're also looking at data in the U.S. a little bit later on that will give markets a little bit of impetus. Kaylee, yesterday we already again saw record highs. Record highs it seemed to be the new name of the game, Francine. We are awaiting that data, PPI and retail sales at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time, and of course, the all-important Fed decision tomorrow. Where that left us in the Asian session was a bit mixed. We did have uh, stocks opening up from holidays yesterday, including in China, where actually we fell by about 1%. The Nikkei, though, was a bit higher. What was really going on in China is liquidity concerns. The PBOC deciding to roll over medium-term loans that were due to mature uh, today. That not adding cash back into the system. Thus, you're a bit concerned about liquidity at this point. Another story to follow in China is actually the demand for copper. If you look at the Yangsheng Copper Premium, which essentially gauges China's demand for imports, it's fell to the lowest since 2017. That is dragging on some of the industrial metals today. I also wanted to point out the Australian dollar, the big underperformer in the G10 space, weaker against the U.S. dollar by about three-tenths of one percent on dovish minutes from the RBA. As for what the picture looks like here in the U.S., as Francine mentioned, we did close at record highs yesterday, and it, we look set for more records again this morning, at least judging from the futures market with S&P 500 futures up about seven points. In the Treasury market, we did see a pretty sizable move upward in yields yesterday. Today, though, we're climbing back down by just about a basis point. We're sitting at 1.48 percent ahead of that economic data today and Fed decision tomorrow. I also was talking about some of the industrial metals being dragged down by concerns over China demand. That that includes copper, of course, which is down now, uh, futures down now by the better part of 4%. And finally, just noting Bitcoin, we're hanging now back down below the $40,000 level map. But of course, we continue to get commentary from a number of players. And I wonder how that is uh, factoring into the fluctuations that we're seeing. Yeah, commentary from key players and also technical analysts are now looking for 50,000. So um, <laughs> under 40, we're looking for 50. When we were over 30, we we're looking for 20. I want to take a look at what's going on in Europe right now, Kaylee. We have a bit of a mixed trade. You can see here Spain is down. Germany is up. So um, there are, if you look at the S&P, if you take a look at the broader equity index, there's not a lot of movement. But there is a lot if you look into the individual uh, country benchmarks. So take a look at the DAX. It's the biggest gainer of the European equity index is up two thirds of 1%. Um, if you take a look at the IBEX, which is down uh, four tenths of a percent, you see the dispersion there. It's the biggest loser among European equity indexes. German bonds are coming, well, Bonds are up in price, down in yield, and this is obviously the important thing to watch because it's really a gauge of what investors expect from the ECB. I noticed uh, yesterday Villaroy said they're going to keep on with the stimulus and they'll keep it on at least as long as the Fed does in terms of support for the economy. He also said that the uh, stability of the euro, the value of the euro is the main job for the ECB. Finally, take a look at Airbus. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about this today. The Boeing Airbus um, uh, back and forth in terms of trade, the trade war seems to be coming to an end. So Francine, we'll see how that um, finishes off. And many other tariffs may also drop away at this US-EU summit. Yeah, there's quite a lot going on, Matt. And I know you drew my attention actually to a wonderful story that's one of our most top right on the Bloomberg terminal about Deutsche Bank. Now, we often hear about traders going rogue or, you know, big whales losing money. And this one is a story about Deutsche Bank making a billion dollars because of a trade on freight. It's, I mean, it's fascinating. And a kid. He's a kid. You see that the, the, the trader's like only 35 years old and he's made a billion dollar trade for, I guess these big, big ideas have to come from the kids, don't they? I mean, well, I mean, I wouldn't write anyone off. I don't know if it's an age thing or it's just a brilliance thing. We'll, we'll have a discussion about it throughout uh, the program. Now, look at what's ahead today. Matt, Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey speaks at the City UK Annual Conference. At, 
8.30 a.m. New York time, we'll get U.S. industrial production, PPI and retail sales for May. That's what Kaylee was talking about. U.K. Prime Minister Boris Johnson also holding a bilateral meeting with the Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Finally, they agreed on a trade deal. And then the EU-U.S. summit is actually being held in Brussels. Now, President Biden also wrapping up his first NATO meeting with a range of geopolitical tensions on the Allies' agenda from China to Russia. The Belgian Prime Minister Alexandre de Croo spoke exclusively to our Maria today on the sidelines of the summit about resetting transatlantic ties. We will not be divided. And, and, and that, I think, happened too many times over the last months, was that the United States and Europe were basically uh, split apart. Right. That, I think, is not going to happen uh, that easily anymore. Well, Maria Tadeo joins us now from Brussels with the very latest. Maria, very positive noise there from uh, the Belgian PM. So is the NATO alliance now reinvigorated? Well, Francine, they will tell you it has been, and that was really the message that we heard from pretty much every delegation yesterday, in which they insisted we're now working together. This is a very strong bond. We're all committed to the alliance. When you spoke to the U.S. delegation and what we did yesterday, they also said the same thing. For us, this is a sacred obligation. We're aware that the United States does have this obligation, in particular with some of the Eastern European countries who yesterday expressed their concerns when it comes to Russia. We have seen the Russian military being deployed very close to the eastern border, especially uh, to the Ukrainian uh, border with China very much aligned on that front. You know, they said this could be problematic and it could be also a military threat in the future. The one area, however, where we did see some differences of opinion was how to deal with China. You know, President Biden, of course, taking a much more aggressive tone on that. Angela Merkel, however, said we don't want to be against a country. We want to be able to bring some Something to the table to counter that, but we should not just be against something. We need to be for something. Yeah, the communique released after the meeting mentioned China 10 times. In 2019, it was only mentioned once. Uh, of course, attention now is turning to the EU US summit today. Maria, what's going to be on the agenda? Well, look, uh, this is a working lunch. Uh, we understand it's just going to be a two hour meeting, and then after that, uh, President Biden is going to head to Geneva. What is interesting, though, is that ahead of the summit, uh, the head of the European Commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, he will be meeting with her, just did a press conference, and she said, and this line is very striking on China, that Europe wants to diversify imports away from producers in China. We want to care about sustainability, less environment damage, more transparency on labor conditions. You know, this is the European Commission taking a much tougher tone on China when it comes to commercial relations and perhaps aligning itself closer to the U.S. position on that front. I have to say this is the toughest language I've ever heard from Ursula von der Leyen on the commercial relationship with China. What's the story with Boeing and Airbus? So they've reached a deal in an attempt to end the trade dispute. It looks like they're going to extend aircraft tariff suspensions by five years. So it's not completely ended, but they're trying to do something about it. Yeah, look, it's not completely ended. And to some extent, Matt, it really makes sense that this is happening today. This five-year truce for five uh, years, there will be a limitation into the amount of state aid that could go into those two companies. We know that to the extent that there are still tensions emerging as to whether or not this leads to unfair competition, it's still very much on the table. But today, of course, they want to leave on good terms. They want to be able to announce something, and this is what they're doing, you know, to say we're going to remove those tariffs from European products, from American American products and agreed to a five-year truce. Now, the problem is not going away, but it does signal that there is a declaration of intentions here that during the Biden administration, there won't be tariffs kicking in into European uh, products, and that is something that I'm sure the EU will welcome. Maria, thanks so much. Bloomberg's Maria today with their reporting from Brussels. Meanwhile, the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is pushing back his plan to lift coronavirus restrictions by four weeks as a more infectious variant continues to rapidly spread. Well, joining us now, Sam Fazelli, your senior pharmaceuticals analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Sam, why do we have such a large presence of this Delta variant and it's not so present in the US or in Europe? Is it a vaccination problem? No, well, perhaps a little bit, but I think, Francine, one of the issues that we're dealing with is that there has been a, obviously, there's a very large community, um, Indian community in the UK, which 
continued therefore to, to travel and um, many asymptomatic people or mildly symptomatic people came into the UK with that uh, variant. I think that's what's been seeding in here but there's definitely um, um, signs that there are seeds of this uh, Delta variant everywhere. Perhaps uh, I've seen numbers that keep changing, Spain a bit higher, certainly in the U United States getting up to 10% potentially. So they have to watch out. Sam, um, I thought Aduhelm was not a good name. Not a great name, at least. The marketing team could have done better. Meanwhile, AstraZeneca has a treatment called Storm Chaser, and that is an awesome name. But what's the deal? Did it miss um, its goals in a trial? Yeah, it's the first time they were trying it in a proper setup. Um, and it, it's an antibody that was uh, is aimed at, and I don't think it's finished yet. Uh, preventing infection if you've been in touch, in contact with somebody and you've had a hundred vaccine. So although it missed the end point of the trial and the Regeneron antibody, for instance, cocktail worked very well, there were telltale signs in the uh, data when you look into it that actually if you give it long enough before, i.e. give you a good protection, um, it, it could go up to 92% uh, prevention. All right, thank you so much to Sam Fazelli of Bloomberg Intelligence. Now I want to take a quick check on some stocks moving in free market trading here in the U.S. One of the big ones to the upside is actually a small cap company, Torchlight Energy, higher by 34% in early hours after declaring a special dividend. I would note as of yesterday's close, this stock up 411% year to date. Another stock moving to the upside is Novavax. It released pretty positive data from a study combining an influenza vaccine and a COVID. 19 vaccine. It suggests that uh, dual immunization actually may be a good strategy. That stock up about 2.6%. To the downside, though, one of the latest Reddit stocks, Petco, was mentioned on the Wall Street Bets forum. It rallied 18% yesterday. Today, though, giving back some of that gain shares down the better part of 4% before the Bell Francine. Uh, Kaylee, we'll talk, of course, about the variants and what it means for the recovery with it. Trevor Greetham, he's up next. He's from Royal London, where he's asset management head of multi-asset. And then a little bit later, Lori Heinlo, State Street Global Advisors, Global Chief Investment Officer. We'll ask her maybe some of the Reddit names that Kaylee were also talking about. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in Berlin with Kaylee uh, Lines in New York and Francine Lacroix in London. Now, inflation has been the story for months, and the data points have been coming in hot for the past few weeks. But a couple of commodities have started to turn over. Bloomberg News has written a story about it. Corn to copper. Uh, lumber futures have absolutely crashed. And they also point out housing is one of those indicators that has turned over. That's what I'm looking at in my chart today. And for our listeners on London DAB Digital Radio, um, I'll walk you through this chart. Basically, consumers' plans to buy homes have jumped during the pandemic. We all know that. Everybody wants a better kitchen from which to work. But now they have dropped in the most recent survey. And um, some people are saying this is maybe a sign that the inflation in housing may be coming to an end. I think it could be that consumers are discouraged by the inflation they've seen in prices and a lack of inventory. Let's turn to Trevor Greetham to talk about this. He's head of multi-asset at Royal London Asset Management. And Trevor, you know, the reason I, I thought about this when we um, brought you on is that you are overweight commodities still and you see inflation as a legitimate threat at this point. Yes, I mean, it's... Uh we're overweight commodities in our multi-asset funds. We're underweight government bonds. We're pretty neutral equities. What we like about commodities is there's a big service sector-led recovery that we're expecting to see over the, the next two or three quarters in the developed world. Been pushed back a little bit in the UK, but, but it's pretty clear you are going to see service sectors get back closer to normal. Um, and that really is going to drive a lot of extra travel spending, which is obviously energy commodities. And we're also going to see a lot of capital spending, particularly on the on the uh, the green agenda, which which boosts things like copper and a whole load of the 
uh, industrial metals. Um, and I'm not surprised to see lumber weakening because um, mortgage rates are starting to edge higher in the US. And housing is a very long lead indicator. It responded very quickly to looser monetary policy. I'm not, not surprised to see housing start to, to roll over at the moment. But I think there's a big, tremendous, you know, northern hemisphere economic recovery uh, yet to come. And while China is starting to tighten, it's not tightening with any kind of real feeling. Um, so I think commodity prices have got quite a bit more to go. And therefore, inflation pressures, I think, will continue to build. But Trevor, I mean, they'll continue to build to a point where it becomes uncomfortable with the Fed because the market seems to have repriced some of that expectations of, of tapering too quickly. So they seem to now believe the Fed that it's transitory. Yeah, yeah. So I think that it's possible that the bond market's got a bit ahead of themselves in terms of timing and positioning. Um, we thought that the bond yields would rise coming into this period because we could see the very big year on year base effect that was going to boost the published inflation numbers. And we thought that would get people more worried about inflation. I think what the market's now doing is it's saying, well, those those year on year comparisons are going to get slightly easier in the sense that inflation rates will probably come down over the next two or three months. And that will play into the Fed's narrative that this is, this is transitory. But if you look at policy, you've still got a Fed that isn't talking about tapering. You've still got um, a government that's just spent 1.9 trillion US dollars and has got another couple of trillion coming down the pipe, which ultimately will be tax financed, but I think they'll be front loaded. Uh, and you've got the service sector recovery I've already mentioned. So I think this could be a monumental policy mistake, looking back at it later, like the 1970s, where you have massively loose fiscal and monetary policy when the economy is going to recover if you do nothing to it at the moment. So do you think we are potentially set up for a hawkish surprise from the Fed this week? And what reaction would you expect from the bond market? Because you say you're underweight government bonds, which has been a little bit of a mm. pain trade recently. How mispriced are they, mm -hmm. especially if that's coming on Wednesday? I don't think the Fed will choose now to, to, to reset expectations massively. I think, think over the summer, it's quite possible that yields will will drift. But I think as the year progresses, it's going to be harder and harder to, 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 to avoid talking about um, some form of tightening. And so I wouldn't be surprised to see the 10-year Treasury trading towards 2% later in, the, later in the summer. But at the moment, uh, I'm not expecting the Fed really to do very much to move, move the bond yield. They want the market to think it's transitory, partly because they want to really uh, keep policy loose. Um, and I can understand when I say it's a mistake, I can understand why policymakers don't want to take risks with COVID. You know, what we're seeing in the UK, I think we will see elsewhere. We will export mm. the Delta variant to Europe and the US. And, and so this is a very bumpy situation. And policymakers don't want to be tightening too soon. Uh, but I do think it means that later in the year, you're going to, again, get people worried about tightening. And it's a very kind of um, two-way pull for stock markets. Because when you've got the bond yield dropping and earnings numbers are still coming in strong, stock markets can make new highs and the tech sector can rally. But when you get that concern about tightening and bond yields go up, you'll get the stock market coming down again with the tech sector selling off. So I think you'll right. see a lot of two-way noise over the summer. Trevor, thanks so much. Uh, too short a time, so we'll have to get you back on really soon. Trevor Greetham, they're head of multi-asset at Royal London Asset Management. Now, tomorrow, stay with Bloomberg for a special coverage of the Fed decision and news conference. It all starts at 1.30 p.m. in New York, 6.30 p.m. in London, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Francine Lacqua in London and Matt Miller in Berlin. Now let's get the first word news and Deutsche Bank is set to take in a billion dollars on a trader's shipping bet. London trader Mark Spine made a long shot bet on the once distressed Israeli company Zim Integrated Shipping Services. That's put Deutsche Bank on track for one of its biggest wins since its trades against U.S. subprime securities more than a decade ago. And Jamie Dimon warns that Wall Street's pandemic era trading boom may be coming to an end. JP Morgan CEO signaled that his bank could see a 38% drop in trading revenue from a year ago. That's a bigger drop than previously expected. Meanwhile, Dimon says it could be one of the best quarters ever for mergers and acquisitions revenue. 
And Matt, of course, we knew that the volatility couldn't last forever. Banks were going to have to look elsewhere uh, to keep raking in, raking in the kind of money they have been over the last year or so. And maybe m and is where it's going to be at. Yeah, for sure. Um, M&A is very strong. Jamie Dimon was very positive on M&A. And of course, um, you know, we knew last year that trading this year wouldn't uh, be at those levels. They were off the hook. So um, the problem is they're coming in a little bit under Wall Street forecasts. Yeah, to be expected. I mean, within the range, but you're right. It was a little bit below expectations. And then we also have this great Deutsche Bank story. And then the other one is, of course, the working from home. I also referred to Matt's great chart yesterday that said, despite the rally we had in EU yeah. banks, they're still undervalued. I don't know whether taxation comes in and whether uh, that means that things could change the fortunes of EU banks. Coming up next, we may talk banks with Laurie Heinel, State Street Global Advisors, Global Chief Investment Officer. She's up next, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lachman, London. Matt Miller in Berlin. Kaylee Lines in New York. Now, quite a lot going on. We are expecting some data over in the U.S., Matt. That will give us maybe an indication of what we're looking at for the markets. Then we had that liquidity concern in China. And, of course, we're on the back of the NATO. Uh, we have now, you know, some possible agreement between the U.S. and the EU. And then tomorrow we look at Biden and Putin. And the Fed. It's all about the Fed, right? I mean, that's really um, the main event this week. So I look at the 10-year yield dropping down to below 150. It briefly made it back up again a little bit yesterday, but then ducked its head back down again. If the Fed is at all hawkish tomorrow, we are going to go to the races. And, you know, it may be just a change on the dot plot, all, all it takes. So it'll be really interesting to watch rates around tomorrow's meeting. Yeah, and that will, of course, move the markets. So yesterday, we were at record high, Kaylee. Record highs again this morning, Francine. Actually, in Europe, the stock 600 today is set for its eighth consecutive record high. The thing about it, though, is actually over the last eight days as it's reached record after record it's only up about 1.6 percent over that time again we are looking at relatively small gains today even if we do climb to an all-time high only up about four tenths of one percent here in the u.s we also closed at records yesterday look set for more of them today if you're looking at the futures market s p 500 futures up about five and a half points right now matt you were just talking at the bond about the bond market hitting that 150 threshold again yesterday but we are back below it this morning at 148 ahead of this morning's economic data and tomorrow's Fed decision. And then we've also been talking about the cooling down in the rally of some of the industrial metals. Copper futures lower by 3.8%. That in turn is weighing some stocks tied to metals and mining, uh, weighing on some stocks tied to metals and mining in pre-market trading. One of them being Freeport McMoran. It's down by about 2%. You have Cleveland Cliffs down as well. And then some other stocks I wanted to check on have to do with the meme uh, stock Reddit phenomenon. Petco, which trades under the ticker Woof, rose 18% yesterday after getting Woof. mentioned on Wall Street Bets. Woof, Matt, is the best ticker ever, down about 3.6%. And AMC is lower by about 2.25% as well. I like it. I like it. It used to be if you pulled up Harley Davidson, yeah. uh, H O G equity on the terminal, it said oink right in the top. <laughs> I think some programmer and Pat says put meow. that in, in there. It, yeah. <laughs> there you go. I, I love those <laughs> things, and 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 now they're gone. Um, you know what though? There have been some really positive developments in the present. One of those is the savings rate. I guess that seems like a good thing, right? And it's been across um, a, a continental, a transcontinental issue. Take a look at this chart for our viewers on radio. I'll just tell you that you know we didn't save too much. Um, Americans uh, here represented in white, the UK represented in blue we're saving less than 10 percent and europeans not very much more than 10 percent over the past few years but of course the pandemic hit and there was not much to spend your money on as a result the savings rate absolutely soared in uh, this is the u.s uh, the uk and germany now, it's come down a little bit here, but it's still at 14% for U.S. savings, 15 almost. That's a pretty incredible savings rate, and this is part of what 
you know, Folkerts, Landau and Hooper expect to drive growth and possibly also inflation to unsustainable levels, Francine. So this is something I think that we all need to watch. I guess it depends how broad it is and how much of it really is in cash that you can just put out there, um, but it could drive the economy and inflation over the coming months and years. I love that chart. Matt. Now, discussing this and her mid-year global outlook is Laurie Heinel, Global Chief Investment Officer at State Street Global Advisors. Laurie, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Now, the broad market views that you've put out there and positioning is basically your overweight equities and overweight spread, underweight bonds, and you want to uh, diversify some of the growth asset exposure. What looks frothy right now? Well, a lot of parts of the market look a little bit overdone. And part of the reason that we've been diversifying our equity exposures is that we think that the U.S. is doing well and it'll continue to do well, but there are other parts of the world that are starting to look more attractive. So Europe, for example, much more attractive from a valuation perspective and a little earlier on in its economic recovery. So we have started to look at Europe as a, a theme. So where do you see the most value in Europe? If you look at uh, some of the disbursement of the tranche, which, you know, we talk about uh, every couple of weeks, but if you look at, you know, the chip shortage, is there a specific way to take advantage of what's going on in Europe over the summer? Well, Europe generically is a bit more value oriented than the U.S. indices, so much less uh, weighting to technology, for example. But do you do have some healthy growth areas. You've got pharmaceuticals. Uh, certainly, you've got some retail. You've got some financials. So it's really both a valuation perspective from a broad region standpoint, but also that kind of rotation to value, which should do better as we uh, get a little longer in the recovery. At some point, there's going to be a hawkish turn, right, Lori? I mean, at some point. Um, yesterday, Villaroy said that the ECB is going to keep stimulating the economy, keep supporting this economy, at least as long as the Fed. Who do you think blinks first? <laughs> Uh, look, it's a little too early to tell. Uh, right now, none of the central bankers are really interested in blinking. Uh, it's, it's easy to think that we're getting ahead of ourselves here in terms of recovery, but we still have a lot of vulnerability. Uh, we're seeing new variants, for example. Uh, the UK, for example, just uh, you know, delayed its full reopening again. So there are lots of reasons to be still a bit more cautious, and we think that central bankers are actually being uh, quite smart about not uh, being too aggressive at choking off this recovery because it is still very early days. So we have been getting a lot of warnings, though, lately from uh, uh, Deutsche Bank that I mentioned earlier, from Andy Haldane and from a lot of other um, very brilliant minds that say this is a really dangerous moment for central banks. Do you disagree? It is a dangerous moment, and part of that is how the market reacts to what they say and what they do. So we do think that the communication and the messaging of any change in policy is going to be quite delicate. So you know, certainly when we uh, read the minutes tomorrow or hear the statements tomorrow, one of the things that everybody's going to be hanging on is every word of the central bank. Are they saying hmm. anything that suggests that they're going to accelerate uh, the reduction in asset purchases or pull forward uh, some of their rate increase expectations? So that's going to be the delicacy here is not sort of how the central banks continue to do what they're doing, but how they communicate what they might do in the future and when. Well, and of course, we have a, a lot of conversation about timing, when mm. normalization will start. But how long is normalization going to take? Yeah, look, it could take a very elongated period because, as you note, uh, you know, we're rock bottom levels. You know, it's this idea that somehow getting back to, you know, 1% or 2% is going to be devastating. Uh, eventually, we'll probably get back to something far north of that. But there's a long, long runway to get there. And, and again, one of the most important things is going to be, does the Fed and as well as other central bankers continue to monitor the current environment? How do they communicate to markets about what they're intending to do? And how do they delicately balance that, that pivot to eventually pulling back a little bit of the stimulus. And as we look forward to normalization, as we see inflation coming in pretty hot, we have equities hanging out around record highs and a 10-year yield mm -hmm. at 1.48%. Is this just complacency? 
Well, certainly there's, there's fear of complacency here, but there are also fundamentals that are driving this. Again, we're gonna have really strong er, uh, growth this year, as well as into 2022, we believe, and that's gonna propel earnings growth for companies. Keep in mind that a little bit of inflation is actually quite positive for equities in general. It gives them a bit of pricing power. Uh, and so that will be uh, one of the ballasts that'll continue to propel this market higher still. So it's, it's a little bit of complacency, but it's also fundamentals. Laurie, when you look at you know some of the things that we talk day in day out, which is cryptocurrencies, is there a point where I know you're you know it's not something that you want to get involved with at the moment, mm -hmm. but what could change your mind? Is there something that could evolve into something that asset managers just can't ignore? Well, one of the big things is going to be how does this space get regulated and how does it get more integrated into the regular economy and the regular um, monetary transmission mechanism? So things where you know central banks, for example, start to become more supportive uh, would be positives. Uh, the idea of blockchain is clearly a, a technology that many are embracing and has a lot of promise. And so the role that cryptos might play in blockchain would be important as well. But keep in mind that there are literally thousands of different crypto cryptocurrencies and so which ones are one or ones are, are going to ultimately benefit from that from that is a little difficult to discern just yet Lori, thank you so much Lori Heinel there global chief investment officer at state street global advisors also with her new calls out for the rest of the year now coming up we'll talk about nato we'll talk about biden in europe with guntram wolf he's bruegel director this is bloomberg This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Francine Lacqua in London and Matt Miller in Berlin. Well, President Biden continues his trip in Europe today with an EU summit. The key issues from relations with China to action on climate change are on the agenda. And we're joined now by an expert in geopolitics and the European Union. He's Guntram Wolf, director of the Bruegel Think Tank. He's also held positions at the IMF, the G20 and the European Commission, which makes you the perfect person to talk about this week. Given what we've already seen at the G7 summit and the NATO summit yesterday, how productive do you think this U.S.-EU summit will be today? Well, look, I think the first point is really that everybody is so relieved to, uh, to be able to talk to each other frankly and openly uh, again. Um, I think it's, it's been such a relief to, to have uh, a, a sort of pro-European U.S. president back, back in Europe. Um, and really be able to to see eye on eye on many many of the issues. Um, now, um, the uh, I would say what we've learned is also that sort of on the headline, um, that it's it's relatively easy to agree, but I think on the details, it's much more difficult to agree. Um, and I think the big challenge um, that uh, these um, leaders today will face is really on the trade side to come up with something very concrete, um, but also on the vaccination uh, story. I think uh, the G7 meeting was not yet fully satisfactory, and I, I would hope that they um, would agree on, on something in addition to what has been agreed. So, Guntram, what does the U.S. need from Europe and what does Europe need from the U.S.? Is this, you know, an alliance that actually is necessary just to deal with China and Russia? And together, are they strong enough to change the world order? Well, I mean, I, I think the natural tendency uh, for, for Europe is, of course, to be very aligned uh, with the United States. And, you know, feel, we feel much more closer than uh, to, to the U.S. Than, than to China. But I think already in the G7 communique uh, and afterwards in the communication around it, you could see that while uh, President Biden takes a very tough stance on China, uh, the Europeans are much more nuanced. And I think they are much more uh, nuanced for a reason because, you know, basically um, it is in the EU's interest um, to um, have commercial ties with both um, the US and with China. Um, and um, it's very difficult for the EU to just give up on, on, the, on the China relation. So, so yes, I mean, of course, on some matters uh, such as human rights, but also um, 
um, you know, uh, the, the, the way the Chinese state system, state economy operates, um, we are extremely well aligned uh, with, uh, with the U.S. Um, uh, but I think the approach, how to tackle um, the um, China issue, will be different and will remain different. But I, I think it's clear there is more collaboration with this president than with the previous yeah. one in China. But Gunther, so how should Europe actually speak to China? You know, it, Europe is also losing Angela Merkel. They, Brexit happened, so the UK is not really in, in that club anymore. How difficult is it going to be to keep these economic relations whilst you know, keeping on check on human rights, but also some of the econ economic policies coming out of China? Well, I mean, my impression is that um, there is a big, there will be quite some shifts in in the way the EU talks with China. I mean, at the moment, uh, it's still very much driven by by Mrs. Merkel, the German Chancellor, who has taken a very, if I can say so, pragmatic approach. So basically, one where the emphasis is on um, basically the um, uh, economic uh, relation. Um, the fair, it's pragmatic in the sense that it says, well, China exists, we have to deal with China. Um, and I think the new German uh, administration could well um, take a tougher stance, meaning one that puts values such as human rights um, uh, more upfront and will be more confrontational. And the question is, will a more confrontational approach deliver anything? And, uh, you know, I, I frankly speaking, I have my doubts because uh, President Trump has been extremely confrontational. And in the end, what did he achieve? He didn't get anything from China. So so I think we need to work with China. We have to set red lines, um, of course. We have to defend our interests domestically. But we also have to recognize that we have to work with China. I mean, China is just one of the biggest powers in the world. Um, and it's an economic superpower and a military superpower. So we have to work with China um, as well as with the US. Um, but we have to, to call but, out um, mistakes. But not, but not with Russia, right? I mean, especially as um, President Putin is annexing Crimea and Russia is having people killed in foreign countries and, and holding Alexei Navalny prisoner. Um, and yet Berlin wants to make a huge trade deal with Russia in terms of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Why does uh, NATO allow that? Yeah, I mean, look, I think there I'm very much um, uh, on the side of the U.S. I mean, I I think we have been uh, too much in the business of appeasing appeasing Russia, doing deals with Russia instead of uh, showing uh, a clear confrontational line. I mean, the EU has been able to impose sanctions on Russia for quite some time now following the uh, occupation of Crimea and the annexation of Crimea. But I think uh, what is needed is, is a more confrontational approach. I mean, the, the, this is a, quite a problematic regime with Navalny and many other human rights abuses, and the EU needs to, needs to show a tough line. And, and it can show a tough line because economically we are not dependent on Russia. I mean, there's a bit of a gas dependency, and you know the, the aim should be to reduce that gas dependency vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Russia, not to increase it. And, then, and in that sense, Nord Stream 2, I think, goes in the wrong direction. Guntram, thank you so much for all of your insight. Guntram Wolf there, director at Bruegel. Now, a little bit later on Bloomberg Surveillance, we'll continue discussing the EU-US summit with the US Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo. That's at 8.30 a.m. in New York, 1.30 p.m. in London, and this is Bloomberg. I think crypto is the next internet-sized opportunity for the United States. I think it has the, the potential to create as many, if not more, jobs in the internet, similar with economic growth. Um, I think it has the potential to square the circle on the privacy internet issues that we've been talking about with big tech companies for the last 10 years. 
Fred Ersham there, Coinbase and Paradigm co-founder discussing crypto's potential on the latest episode of Bloomberg Studio 1.0 with Emily Chang. You can watch the full episode of that this Wednesday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And on Thursday, also across our other regions, I'm guessing you can find it online as well. There's so many ways to access Bloomberg Television content. Now, 99 percent of cryptocurrencies are overpriced that according to digital currency group ceo barry silbert in a tweet conversation with joe weisenthal joe is the coast <laughs> of what you miss of course he joins us now to discuss i thought this was uh in well truly fascinating joe because you'd expect silbert to be a cheerleader yeah um uh, or at the very least you know massage a little optimism into the story of cryptos and yet he told you 99% are overvalued. Well, I think there's two Why? things. One is that, I mean, I think if you talk to most people in this space, they will agree. Even the ardent bulls will admit there is a lot of junk in this space. And, you know, if you go to like a site like CoinMarketCap, as I noted in a piece, there's like 10,000 coins. Like on TV, maybe we talk about like two or three sometimes, but there's thousands and thousands. You know, also look oh, like uh, the people in this space, tend to have investments in some of the big ones that everyone knows and talks about, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, and they would probably like new people who enter the space to not just go find some cheap nominal coin that, you know, looks like it's inexpensive and uh, buy, you know, buy their bags to some extent. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, you, can, you can denigrate lots of uh, crypto while also theoretically uh, uh, benefiting the investments that you have. I mean, I really just want to know what's in the one percent that isn't overpriced yeah. that that he thinks. Uh, but speak like when we say ninety nine percent yeah. of an entire asset class is overpriced, what does that mean about the use case or the investment thesis? I mean, oh, it's no. a really good question, and it's a way that cryptocurrencies, to the extent that there is a use case that exists, and of course people debate this nonstop. Um, you know, this space is like riven with junk and everybody knows it. And there are coins that have no purposes and there are coins that are jokes and there are coins that are almost blatant Ponzi schemes, Ponzi schemes and pump and dump schemes <laughs> where everybody who's in on it knows and the only goal is to get in before other people do. And so it's not like, you know, other asset classes, commodities, even small ones have niche use, niche use cases. Stocks, many of the small ones have some right. sort of measure of cash flow or something. That's just not the case with uh, many of the coins. So, Joe, does it mean, and good morning from London, does it mean that there's going to be, going to be one coin, right, and it, that'll probably be green, that will end up surviving and being the, the king of coins? To rule I them mean, all. The, the biggest <laughs> coin believers in some of them absolutely believe that. So, of course, Bitcoin maximalists are convinced that in the end there will be one coin. It'll be Bitcoin. Everything will be built on Bitcoin. Everything else they say is a scam or not sufficiently decentralized or something like that. A lot of the people who are into Ethereum are also into Bitcoin, but they're also Ethereum maximalists who essentially believe that that will be the base transaction layer. And then, and that'll be the sort of base layer for everything and that you can build all sorts of decentralized apps on it and so forth. And then there are people who believe in some sort of a multi-coin uh, future in which, you know, there are multiple different chains for niche purposes, maybe one for decentralized finance, another one for NFTs, another one for savings, so forth. Um, you know, look, the space is yeah. so young that uh, no one, I think, has, you can't trust anyone too much on what the future looks like. Joe, thanks so much. I love the word maximalist, uh, crypto maximalist. Joe Weisenthal there, co-host of What Do You Miss? And also overall guru on Twitter. Now, coming up in the next hour, Brian Weinstein. He's Morgan Stanley Investment Management Head of Global Fixed Income. We look at the Fed tomorrow. We look at markets. We look at U.S. data today. And, of course, Biden on his European tour. This is Bloomberg 99.9.